Good morning, everyone. I would like to call to order the hybrid virtual Pasco County Board of County Commissioner meeting of February 9th, 2021. I would like to remind everyone to please silence all electronic devices and mute your microphones. At this time, I would like to ask you to please stand for the invocation and pledge. Oh, Mercedes, your hand is open wide to satisfy the needs of every living creature. Make us thankful for your loving providence and grant that we, remembering the account that we must one day give, may be faithful stewards of your good gifts. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Here. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Here. District 4, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Here. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Here. District 1, Chairman Oakley. Here. Oh, there it goes. Better. Okay. Mr. Steinsteiner, will you please uh, go over today's proceeding with the BCC? Be happy to, Mr. Chairman. On March 12, 2020, the Board of County Commissioners declared a local state of emergency after the governor issued Executive Orders 2051 and 2052, the public health emergency and the state of emergency, respectively, related to COVID. 2052 was most recently extended by Executive Order 2316 on December 29, 2020. The board has chosen to hold its meetings with a quorum physically present, utilizing communications media technology for the public and team members to participate. A detailed notice indicating the board's intent to conduct a hybrid virtual meeting has been posted on the board's website. On September 25th, 2020, the governor issued Executive Order 20-244, moving the state into phase three of the governor's safe, smart, and step-by-step -step order. Which, extended, which was extended by Executive Order 2297, issued on November 24th, 2020. Large gatherings of over 50 people is still not recommended to congregate in any public place that does not readily allow for appropriate social distancing. State Surgeon General's public health advisory is still in place with regard to maintaining social distancing and avoiding gatherings of 10 or more people. The public is afforded an opportunity to make public comments either in writing or by the use of communications technology that has been provided. The board adopted resolution 20-182 on June 30th, 2020, establishing the procedural rules for a hybrid virtual meeting, such as the one being held today. As with any meeting, you should take action. You are required to take public comment on any proposition uh, pursuant to section 286 Point oh one one four Florida statutes. I'm available for any questions. Okay. Uh, like to remind everyone uh, today, R52 will be heard after the public hearings this afternoon. So uh, now it's time for public comment. Citizens are given an opportunity to comment on any incoming, any item coming before the board during the public. Um, comment section. The board also takes public comment on items to be placed on future board agenda and other business under their purview. Due to COVID-19 operations and to safeguard the uh, well-being, safety for our citizens and staff, today's public comment will be handled as follows. Number one, first, I will take public comment from those that pre-registered WebEx link and are currently in queue. After we will read the, record or record the comments, documents, PowerPoints, videos that have been identified from, from members of the public to be read into uh, the meeting and played it, and those videos played at the meeting or received and filed. Finally, we will take public comment on those currently signed up at the kiosks, 
Comments are not to exceed three minutes per person. This, this new format uh, does not weigh the request that when you address the board and comments are not, are not directed personally against any commissioner or team member, but rather directed as, is, as the issues. This provides mutual respect between board members and the public. For WebEx and Kiox participants, after saying your name and address for the clerk, the timer will uh, activate and we'll start a countdown. After two minutes, one beep will sound, letting you know that you have one minute remaining. After the timer is, is up, two beeps will sound and including the, that includes the, excuse me, indicating three minutes are up and you should close your comments. WebEx participants will be uh, disconnected when their time is up and Kiox participants will be asked to move away from the Kiox. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone signed up for the WebEx? Yes, uh, Chairman, two individuals uh, signed up, one is logged in. We have Ms. Lauren Gentry on the WebEx. Okay. Please state your name and address. Yes, my name is Lauren Gentry. I reside in Tallahassee, Florida at 211 Britt Street. Um, I have an item on the consent agenda and I'm simply logged in um, in the event that the commissioners had any questions on that. No comments at this time. Okay, thank you. You didn't say what item. What item number? She, her item is the Bridgewater CDD um, item that is under my portion of the agenda. I think it's C6. That is correct. Okay. That's correct, oh. C6. All right, thank you. Second person? There are the a second person who signed up is not on WebEx. So we just go on. Okay. Um, so do we have any emails to be read into record or? So um, the only email that was sent in was sent in after the hybrid pub, uh, virtual public comment closed. The email did ask, uh, the person asked for it to be read into the record, but it has closed. Um, the email was forwarded to all of the commissioners. It will be part of the record as received and filed. Read that in or? It didn't comply with your rules. So, I mean, it's been provided to the commissioners so that they can read it. And it's in the record. And it's in the record. Okay. All right. Um, what's the next? Kiosk. Kiosk. Anyone at the Kiosk this morning to speak? Yes. Yeah, they're not. There is one. There's nobody there? Yes, there is. Yes. Oh, there is one. Okay. <laughs> Please state your name and address for the record. Nancy Hayeswood, 34110, a nice place, Dade City, Florida. Okay. All right, so welcome to 2021. Um, I did try to come to another session and found that the kiosk here was closed. It was because it was in Newport Ritchie, even though it was a matter that was in our area. So that was about a month ago. I missed your first one. Uh, I, I, one thing, you should keep the kiosk open. We have spotty internet. So we can't do it that way. The phone doesn't always work out here. And we've actually got older people that it's going to be hard for them to get all the way over to Newport Ritchie. Uh, I don't understand why you can't do that. It seems like a pretty simple thing to me. <clears throat> there are actually people out here with no internet at all. And my first thought when I was not allowed, when I found it was closed, was they did this on purpose. I thought, no, they wouldn't do that. They just don't understand that there are people that might want to address this matter. The particular issue that I wanted to address actually had 150 people right into it. So I don't know why it was put in dates in Newport Ritchie anyways. So 
So what I'd like to ask is that y'all find a way to keep both these kiosks open for the board meetings and the planning commission so nobody else has to have such a frustrating experience of coming up here and not even having time to drive to New York Fort Ritchie if they can to address the board. Nobody should be cut out from addressing the board. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Anyone else at the kiosk or this only person? There is nobody else here at the kiosk. All right, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Just on behalf of the team and the staff and the board, can I just make a statement real quick? You may. Thank you, sir. Um, and I, while I appreciate the comments that were just made, I just want to remind um, everyone and just, you know, that's watching at home is that typically when we speak at person, it's either at whichever site the meeting's at. There's actually more opportunity now to speak to the Board of County Commissioners than there's ever been before, because now you do have the opportunity to speak via WebEx or the telephone, as well as go to the kiosk at the site. So there's more opportunity, and you can actually send in emails and be read into the record as well. So there's three options now, in addition to going live on site that had never happened before. So more opportunity, not less opportunity to speak to the Board of County Commissioners. Right. Because from before, you had to be here to, to speak. You would still have to drive over to the site. Yeah. Yes, sir. Exactly. Three more opportunities now. I just want to make sure that's for the record. Okay. That for those yep. watching home, you have three opportunities in addition to coming live on at the kiosk. Yeah. Even if it's on the other side of the county, you still can call in. Yeah. Or, or send the, an email. Or do the WebEx we can watch on video, too. Yeah. Yes, that's true. All right. That, uh, that is one. Um, now it's time for the consent agenda, and I have a pull sheet. I have C5, pull and revise, C11, pull and revise, C41, withdraw, C50, uh, discuss, pull and discuss. So What's the pleasure on the remainder of the items, or do you have any other items you'd like to pull at this time? In a move for approval. I have Thank a motion. You. Second. And a second to approve all the other consent items. Uh, all those in favor? The roll call vote because roll call. Commissioner Mar Mariana Adam. is not here. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 1, Chairman Oakley. Aye. Motion passed 5 0. Okay. Uh, C5, pull and revise. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, that's my item. Um, the uh, attachment agreement for professional services between Pasco County and Gray Robinson PA is actually dated May 29th, 2018, not December. 16th, 2020. Um, and so it's a revision to the attachment date and and you've all been provided a copy of that attachment. Okay. Pleasure of the board. Move for approval. Second. A motion to approve and a second. All those in favor by roll call vote. Yep. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, <clears throat> Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 1, Chairman Oakley. Aye. Motion passed 5 0. Uh, C41 has been withdrawn. We go to discussion on C50. Ms. Starkey? Yes. Um, I was looking at that contract and um, I noticed that there are three different fees for three different kind of bus benches. That's my first question. Why are we not going to a uniform kind of bus bench, which I thought we were doing in the last contract? Thank you. Kathy Pearson, Assistant County Administrator, Public Services. I do have Kurt Scheibel on the um, line, and he can explain that to you, Kurt. Kurt, are you there? Mm. While he's coming, that you know, so I, I, I am here. Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah, go ahead, Kurt. 
Well, this is Kurt Scheibel, Director of Pasco County Public Transportation. Uh, Commissioner um, Starkey, the reason why we went with three different benches is we were looking at some areas I think will do better with a maybe uh, look better at the neighborhood and make the neighborhood look better with different style of benches. The standard will still be the cement benches that are normally out there like right now. But um, at some places like on uh, in Newport Ritchie or along US 19, we would be using those um, benches there. Okay. Um, my next question is, and I, I'm sure none of y'all know this, but I I helped get this right away ordinance back when I was a civic activist. So I'm, it's something that I take an interest in. Back then, we had bus benches at every single road road uh, driveway on 19. They were like appearing overnight. Um, uh the money it's you know it's substantial now and so we're collecting a little kitty um i wanted to know what the budget is expected to be annually for the bus bench and is that money still going to 211 uh, no man the money will be coming to pasco county uh public transportation accounts so as far as i'm aware of and the um different benches we're looking at every bench out there right now to make sure that they do meet the needs that we for the citizens out there so if i can add to that so we made that change a few years ago it used to go to the health and uh, the human services department to help subsidize united way but no it goes directly to the uh pcpt uh, budget now to help subsidize their costs okay do we know what that number is just curious. Uh, Kurt, do you have that number off the top uh, of your head? I want not right now at the top of my head because, like I said, we're looking at all benches, but approximately, if you give me just a quick second. I believe it was a little over 100,000, but I could be wrong. Uh, that's a, um, about the number. And uh, um, as far as going to their budget, is it used for a specific purpose in the budget? Just to help subsidize their operations or whatever that the grant doesn't pick up because they're, most of their grants are either 90, 10, but um, current, I think 90%, 10% we have to pay for. So some are 50, 50. So we used it to, to help match whatever we have to um, help That's subsidize. Correct. 50, 50, 80, 20, or 90, 10, depending on the different grants. And we use it to help the local match section. And it's about um, 20,000 to 30,000 a year, depending on the number of pitches we get. And we will get that bus bench uh, figured to you and email all of you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Move to approve. Second. Okay. Um, I got a motion and a second. All those in favor by roll call vote. District two, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District three, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District four, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District five, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District one, Chairman Oakley. Aye. Motion passed five zero. Okay, that's all we have on the consent agenda. C11. C11 hmm? was pulled and revised, correct? Yeah. Mm. Was we did do C11. We did or didn't? Uh, well, I'll go back. C11. I thought we did. <laughs> I skipped over it. <laughs> Good morning, Chairman and Board Members. I'm Doug Anderson, the Assistant Facilities Management Director for Pasco County. Uh, C11 is revised because of page three was missing in the electronic file and has been added back in. And the attachment memorandum FAC 21-0021 was incorrectly referenced as FAC 200153 and has been corrected. Recommend approval. Move for approval. I got a motion. Second. One second. All those in favor by roll call vote. District two, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District three, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District four, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District five, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District one, Chairman Oakley. Aye. Motion passed five zero. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to regular item. Give me a 
things like okay. R fit. R fifty one. Mr. Chairman, item P51 <clears throat> is code enforcement issues surrounding existing boat lift canopies and review of a draft ordinance to allow new boat lift canopies. And I believe staff is online ready to make the presentation. Um, Mr. Michael Whalen, are you available? Michael, are you there? He's not online. Okay. We can go to the uh, PowerPoint then. Okay, so staff is seeking board direction as to how to handle enforcement of existing illegal canopies. So what's happened is uh, at various board meetings and at workshops over the past couple of years, Board of County Commissioners um, requested information on what was originally called docks and then roof over docks. And a few years ago, inland bodies of water, the issue was put to rest with the inland bodies of water and the question remained for coastal uh, properties. and. At a recent workshop, I believe in September of 2019, the Board of County Commissioners outlined a number of um, uh, additional qualifications and ideas for how to handle the coastal areas of Pasco County. And the question was refined further from roofs over docks to boat lift canopies specifically. Um, and so the Planning and Development Department went back and through spring of 2020 until essentially the fall of 2020, uh, reviewed the project and uh, determined to put together a feasible, a feasible ordinance. Um, and this is sort of the, uh, the outline in the background uh, on the overhead here, uh, to put together a feasible ordinance that the Board of County Commissioners could consider for, for coastal uh, properties. Um, there is a draft of that feasible ordinance that's been put together. However, a question remains regarding uh, what to do with the existing properties uh, that have already built boat lift covers without the ordinance uh, in place. So that's to point five on the slide there. In July and August of 2020, uh, staff observed at least 89 instances of illegal roofs and canopies that were present in, in some of the coastal areas uh, of Pasco County. Next slide. Um, so a number of, there are three main issues here. So the county has not issued permits for these structures and there's no guarantee of safety during storms or otherwise. Um, and the third issue is that there, no review by staff means no guarantee of compliance with the land development code in terms of canal nav navigability standards uh, in terms of how far out they are projecting into the various canals. Next slide. Uh, and this is a quick analysis of where those 89 instances are within the coastal areas of the county. Six are in Gulf Harbors, one is in Killarney Shores, 24 in Leisure Beach, 11 in Pleasure Isles, 23 in Sea Pines, 20 in Sea Ranch, and four in Vista Del Mar. Next slide. Those all were done without permit? Yes, these are the 89 that are pre-existing, so to speak. Uh, and as you can see, they're kind of spread across the coastal uh, areas uh -huh. of the county. So there are a number of enforcement alternatives associated um, with uh, the question before the board today. Uh, to maintain the status quo would be to continue the, to abate enforcement action regarding these structures. So I think it was back in 2016, uh, the BCC uh, determined to first identify what a feasible ordinance might look like and then 
consider what actions might be taken for those properties that have these pre-existing boat lift canopies. That's why it's called the status quo today, why code enforcement actions have not been happening. Um, another alternative is to enforce the existing provisions that are already in our codes. We can proceed with enforcement action to enforce the existing code provisions prohibiting roofs canopies over boats, docks, except on inland lakes because that issue was resolved. Uh, and a third alternative is to enact new provisions and grant amnesty over uh, the, the pre-existing boat lift canopies. Um, that would mean to adopt the proposed land development code amendment that would be coming forward um, and grant amnesty to the existing structures. They would have to then provide the county with a hold harmless agreement. Uh, the fourth alternative is to enact new provisions and then require compliance on top of it. So proceed with the enforcement action once you've got the new ordinance in place. Uh, next slide. This kind of goes a, a little deeper into each of those options uh, and things to consider when, when looking at the, the four options. So in the status quo situation, the problems will persist. Uh, resident, so the status quo is abate code enforcement. Uh, the problems will persist. Residents that want a canopy will continue to install these uh, at, the, at the risk of the county requiring removal, safety and navigability um, remain or worsen as a result. Enforcing the existing provisions, residents would be required to remove the canopies and roofs. This option improves safety and navigability. Enact new provisions and grant amnesty. Um, it doesn't require the removal of the um, various liabilities that are out there. The illegal canopies can continue to exist. It legitimizes those canopies and allows residents without illegal canopies and roofs to apply for permits. Uh, safety and navigability issues would remain because you wouldn't necessarily be addressing the pre-existing conditions that are out there. Um, but there would be likely improvement over time as new uh, structures come online, meeting codes, etc. And then the fourth option would be to, again, enact the new provisions and require compliance. Um, a lot, this allows most existing canopies to be brought into compliance, um, but it may be impossible to bring into compliance without demolition of existing structures, right? So there's going to be that aspect of it where there's going to be significant uh, potential ramifications toward those who have built these prior to uh, any ordinance and provisions. Next slide. So today we're not we're introducing the a, the concept of the ordinance, but we're not actually introducing the actual ordinance language. The discussion is mostly going to be centered, hopefully, mostly centered around what to do with the with the existing um, properties that have uh, these boat lift canopies already in place. Um, an ordinance would come forward based, on, a feasible ordinance at least, would come forward based on the direction that we're seeking from the Board of County Commissioners today. Uh, next slide. But this is, today is not the discussion about the actual ordinance, but rather about what to do with the existing uh, pre Chairman. preconditions. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. If I may, um, I don't believe the Board can take action, and other than to tell staff that they should be enforcing yeah. No. The ord the current ordinance, which is on the books, which is these are these structures are not allowed. You can't take a position today about amnesty if you don't know what the ordinance that you're going to adopt is. So the the presentation that you're getting is really premature um, for direction. for today's discussion. That what we should be discussing is what the ordinance is that you want brought forward. Okay. So the illustration up above uh, illustrates, in a nutshell, what the proposed ordinance might uh, affect for the for the communities. Should we continue with this, saying what a proposed ordinance might look like. Does it matter? Well, yeah, that's what you should be discussing, not info, not not whether you're going to give amnesty to those structures which have been built illegally. If they've been built illegally, they've been built illegally. Great. You need to you need to. If you're going to go forward with any sort of an ordinance that would allow these, that's got to be discussed. If you're going to continue to prohibit them, 
on the golf, which is another option for the board, then there would be no reason to give illegal structures amnesty. So what today's discussion really be, should be before the board is either to introduce, introduce the ordinance that is coming forward to the board or to gain information from the board about what the ordinance should look like that the board wishes to adopt. So we're actually giving them direction for writing their ordinance. Right. That's what we're here to do. Yeah. So, so if, if, if or either, either, either to abandon, the, right. either to abandon this project and say you want to stay with a, with the concept of there shall be no roofs or what sorts of roofs or canopies would be acceptable to the board for an ordinance to come forward so that we we can move this project forward to an adopted ordinance okay. well mr chair mr moore it's either enforce their current ordinance as written or move on to something else there's your choice with the choices that may be given at a, well, future I think date, the, at a future date. The board can determine what it wants to do in an enforcement context after it figures out what it wants to do with the subject matter. Right. What I'm saying. Yeah. Currently, they're prohibited. It's That's not right. being enforced. It should be enforced, but it's not being enforced. Correct? Why is it not being enforced? In reality? It's that would be a question for staff. Yeah. And if you want to make a change to that, that's when we're going to, you may want to delve deeper. So that's a choice you have to make. Stick with the status quo or do something different. Yeah. Right, Jeff? Mm -hmm. Yes. Ms. Starkey? Um, I agree with what the commissioner is saying here. And just for a little history, we have never allowed both covers in the county, but we tweaked the ordinance a few years ago for, for lakes or last year maybe for lakes and i acquiesced to say okay as you know as long as we're leaving this at lakes where no one's view is obstructed and if something blows off those structures are very far from the residents and people and and, and other people's property and therefore i don't feel it's such a safety issue but I am adamantly opposed to changing what has been the historical nature of our coastal area um, where, we, where we don't obstruct other people's views and um, we keep the safety of, other, of property and people um, in mind. You know, we have a lot of residents there who don't live there year round and they're, they're not here in the summer. They're usually up north in the summer. And who's going to look out for their canopies if they're not here? So um, we've got along fine for since the 70s without them. Um, so I would not even want to go on with the presentation and say, I'm, let's just test the water and see if we don't even need to move forward um, on, on the idea. And then we can discuss what we want to do with the current ones that were built um, illegally most most of them with the knowledge that they were illegal but they went ahead and did it anyway so chairman uh, i can't tell if jack's wanting to speak or not i don't see him. yes mr chairman if i could jack mariano yeah yes sir um, I, w I would say that um you know we dealt with the lakes issue was an easy one because it didn't affect people beside them uh, this one here was definitely more sensitive to um, people on canals that live next to each other. But uh, I've talked to many, many people that have boats worth as much as $100,000, maybe some more. And the designs of these covers, which uh, a foot or two over the boat, and the boat there is really not going to affect the view hardly at all. Uh, if the boat's gone, you just have the cover, which is pretty thin to deal with. Um, I think that people should be able to protect their property. Uh, I don't think it will affect the view shed uh, as detrimental as some of the other structures that were probably built or built before. Uh, I think our citizens want to 
live in the water, protect their property, and enjoy it. And I, I, don't, I think the boat cover canopies, which is something I think is a, a very good way to go uh, for our citizens. And I've heard tremendous support for it. There have been pockets of smaller um, that don't want to see it, but for the, for the most part, up and down, you saw the areas, people do want to protect their, their, their property. Okay. Ms. Starkey? Um, so, uh, Commissioner Mariano, I, I live on the water. That's, I, 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 my neighbors are the people who don't want this. My, my fellow Gulf Harbor residents, there's a ver very few who do want this. I met with the HOAs and um, C COAs, uh, uh, community, you know, in Gulf Harbors, we don't have an HOA. We have a um, voluntary, um, um, I can't even remember what the COA is it stands for right now. Oh, Civic Association. And um, they are very concerned about this. And while there are a few that want to cover their boats, I feel this is my community, that the majority don't. And if you want to cover your boat, you can cover your boat without, all you have to do is put a cover on it. Um, I have showed this board before and I, I'm happy to show it. Um, if you, again, if you take Google Earth and you go down the coast again and around the state of Florida, the vast majority do not allow covered boats, uh, covers on their docks for the purposes I stated before. And I think it's a dang dangerous to to make to change this ordinance. I think we need to leave it how it's been and protect the property values and the lives on, on the coast. So, um, uh, yeah. So I I'm in disagreement. I think the majority of people do not want their views obstructed. That's why they they live on the water. They love their view. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, real problem, a real eyesore. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Patrick, I think going back. If there is a current ordinance in place, then they should be enforcing that current ordinance. And I know that something was changed when I was not here, but I think they should be enforcing the current ordinance. And then if they do plan to change ordinance in the future, then they can rebuild later on. And um, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to agree Mr. with uh, Commissioner. Uh, the we have we have many structures that were built without any um, permits, any um, uh, building construction services, you know, no one's gone out there to look at these. And and frankly, we have a company that put them up knowing that they were illegal. And, and, we, and sadly, we watched it happen in our community. And it's really frustrating that people are thumbing our noses at the law. And I think it's, I think that's a problem. Um, so I would agree that these illegal structures need to come down and hopefully um they just buy a canvas cover and throw it over their boat if they want want it to be more protected. the boats are made to be out in the elements and uh and again i encourage you to to go take a google earth trip around the coast and you'll see what i'm talking about All right mr moore so yeah and i can and i appreciate commissioner mariano and, and some of the constituents in the area about protecting boats and and i i get it you know if, had boats, own boats, and things like that. Um, but I, what I will say is, I, I did have a meeting. I think it was last week. I think last Thursday. Um, you know, on the record with a pretty large group of residents from the coast, um, and they were adamantly opposed to it and speaking on a, in um, in support of some of their other residents as well and representing them. So I think about going up and down the coast and. Thankfully, throughout the years, we've had some opportunities to go up and down the coast. Um, most recently, I was over in Palm Beach and in, in West Palm area about a month ago. They don't allow covers there. And when we talk about the prices of, in Fort Lauderdale, Miami, and that'll get to our coast too, we think about the price of those boats. Now, we have some people with some really nice boats over here, but you know, that's a very wealthy area as well. Open, and they've got, you know, the pretty some pretty expensive boats there. And they don't they don't allow it because the the fear is of getting obstructing that view. And you think about unfortunately how some of our canals were built many many years ago in Paso County. They are very very skinny canals. Right. Um, I spent some time going up and down some of the canals. I won't name which which ones because I don't want to give up my fishing spots. But um, <laughs> there's some good fishing spots in within some of those residential canals. Um, 
And they're really, really, really skinny. You cannot even turn a boat around in many of those. Even a, even a lily, uh, you know, a 20, 24 foot boat, you can't, you cannot turn that thing around. So it, it would, it, it can, and it will obstruct those views in those areas. And if you look at the elevation of the homes in that area, they're elevated very high because of the, I guess that would be, has something to do with the flood, the floodplain, if I'm not correct. Um, so they're up higher. So what you'll do is you'll end up looking down at a lot of those canopies. So you're not going to see under them. Now there may be some areas, and then I, not, I don't want to say may, there are some areas in Florida, especially when you go up to the northwestern port, portions of Florida, you know, when you get up maybe more to Crystal River and north of that, where um, they, they're just different. You know, the, the elevations are different. Um, and they may be able to possibly see under them. I'm not saying they can, but it's, it's, it's different. Um, so that's my fear, you know, again, you know, I, I see it, St. Pete, um, uh, Pinellas County, um, Hillsborough County, um, and again, I talked about Palm Beach, Miami, places like that over the East Coast. I can't speak to the northeast, northeastern part of Florida because I haven't spent a whole lot of time up there. They, they don't allow it either. It, just, it, 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 it Really, we talk about safety too, as Commissioner Starkey mentioned, the possibility when you have some of these very tight houses that you can literally reach out your window and almost touch the next one <laughs> and the docks are that close too. So safety is obviously a big consideration as well. I don't want to downplay that. But I think the big one is just obstructing those views. So given somebody buys a home and now a waterfront property and they want to have be able to see down that canal and possibly see the sunset, let's be honest, they paid for it. Um, and now there's a possibility of them losing it. So I appreciate people wanting to protect them. Again, somebody that has, you know, and does own vessels um, wants to protect them as much as possible. But at the same time, um, mine's literally on a trailer outside in a storage place right now as well. And so that's just my thought. And again, I appreciate some of the people that want to have it done. I think, you know, there are opportunities to buy the covers you can buy nowadays are really really good when i say covers the ones that just drape over the boat not a cover on a dock the one you an actual boat cover you purchase snap on the boat possibly or do it or other ways um they're they're pretty high tech nowadays and um uh -huh. it's not like the old throwing an old tarp over the boat anymore you have the opportunity to keep it pretty snug and fit that can protect the inside of those boats just again yeah. my opinion majority of the people i've talked to uh do not want the covers uh they want to deal with with the covers that you put actually on the boat snaps yeah. or whatever so i actually have a boat in homo they don't allow them up there do they, do they have covers no you can have uh, up there they have some the river covers stuff. over boats i actually have a a deck over my boat but yeah your lots are the, different there but I still, why. and the lots and all are different i'm on a canal rather than the river yeah. so i'm just off the river but um I do a snap on cover on my boat, protect it. So yeah. it's, um, I don't necessarily like it all the time, but I do it because it does protect. The main thing you got to protect, the boat itself is fine out, out in the weather and, and sun, but it's the upholstery that the sun will eat up and just, and it'll dry it until it, it you know, starts breaking apart. But, uh, and that's what people are trying to protect, so. But uh, majority of people I've talked to want that. I, I have a little, I don't know exactly what we should be doing about the ones that were put up illegally, but they shouldn't have been put up, number one. So, you know. There's some back in the day, I apologize, Mr. Chairman. There, I know there were some, I think, many, many years ago, maybe, that before there was any type of ordinance that they possibly went up, if I'm not correct, which... Now you have yeah. to, you got to figure out when when were they do when so, were they put up though right Mr Chairman I yeah. guess that that's relatively easy in terms of if you know what the date is so from 2010 forward is clear that this board prohibited dock uh, so, so company the mute um is that we we brought that question. For because there was an enforcement action in in Harbors. Gulf Harbors, um, so that would be that would that's the bright line. We had and we in fact had looked at what had been built 
prior to that date. But Ms. Sims is the enforcement person, so I will let her. Uh, Christy Sims, County Attorney's Office. Um, yes, at this point, we we need to decide is the planning staff going to continue to go down this road drafting this proposed ordinance or does the majority of the board want to keep the current regulations prohibiting them on the coastal areas in place? If so, um, uh, county staff has done a survey. They know which ones are illegal. Um, I am very confident that everyone um, was told that they were erecting them at their own peril and, uh, and we have not given out any permits for any of these canopies or covers. Um, and so Patrick Moore and I with the county attorney's office would be happy to work with uh, building and construction services staff to bring enforcement actions um, to get the illegal canopies that have been erected taken down. But we need first and foremost to, to know, does the board want everybody to continue with this project? Really doesn't make sense for us to go tell somebody to take their canopy down if then the board is gonna turn around and say, yeah, okay, we'll allow them on, under what circumstances. Um, you know, I think that uh, Mr. Pintos um, going back to the beginning, he said that we need to first identify what a feasible ordinance might look like, then decide on enforcement. And what I'm hearing is three members of the board saying they don't want to change. That's, that's, yep. I'm hearing that four too. members saying that actually. So I would call the question. Ms. Chair, yeah, we, do you need a motion? I, if you'd like to make a motion to abandon the yes. to abandon the or the no, abandon no. the previous direction that the board wishes to proceed with an amendment to the land development code to allow right. covers over dots. That's my motion. Guys. No, I thought no, I thought no, I thought Jeff was finishing up something. No, that's, okay, yeah, that I would be the motion. motion. Yeah. Yeah, I second. All right, I got a motion and second. Mr. Uh, Chairman, no discussion? Excuse me. Mr. Mariano? Jack Mariano, thank you. Um, I, I just want to say again, um, you know, I, I know you guys have a lot of people in the that will tell you uh, that they don't want to see them. They're afraid of what can they do to the community. But there's also other people in there that do think it's a good idea to be able to protect the boats. But I will tell you, I think overwhelmingly the people up in the Hudson area from Sea Pines, Leisure Beach, um, that whole area, they do want to be able to protect their boats. Uh, I was asking Terry earlier that maybe we should do like a public hearing meeting uh, out in the public to do, maybe go to the realtor building or some other type of thing. And let's get people in front of us to let them tell us what they think. Uh, a lot of people, and I was comfortable bringing this idea forward to the board this way, as opposed to just doing the public hearing in front of the board. So at least we get some public input at this stage, so when the next speech came forward, the people could be better versed that, okay, this is coming forward, we're gonna go forward. I think if you shortcut it right now and don't bring it as a, as a public hearing, uh, you're not gonna hear from a lot of citizens that have a pretty strong opinion about it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have two comments. I think we should enforce the current ordinance up until the day we do decide to change it or update it because the ones that were built illegally were still built illegally. So they should be in the code should be enforced on those. And then if we still want to have a public hearing, then move forward with that. But as of now, there should not be any, what I'm hearing is there should not be any covered docs out there right now because it is still illegal and code should be enforcing what is the code is saying. Mr. Chairman, um, I appreciate commission, commissioner Mariano's, um, words, but again, I'll reiterate, I live on the water. I've met with many um, of my constituents that live on the water. The vast, vast majority do not want their views obstructed and to be nervous if the storm is coming, if they can even go outside safely. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had a workshop on this already. 
Um, I think there's this has been talked and talked and talked about out there, and I think it's pretty clear that um, the majority don't want it. And I would again, we're under discussion. We have a vote to not move forward on a. We have an item on the floor to not move forward with changes to the ordinance that uh, Commissioner Hildebrand enacted in 2010 because we didn't have any rules and um, they were starting to have problems in Gulf Harbors and the, the Civic Association had to take people to court themselves. Um, it's very expensive. And um, so so the county commission back then, um, I think it was unanimous, um, passed this ordinance and I see no reason to change it. So, okay. We'll have a motion and a second on the floor. Mr. Uh, Chairman, just, just to clarify the commissioners, but, yeah. the commissioner's comments, the county had always taken the position that docks were prohibited. We clarified that position in okay. 2010. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So by road call vote? Dock covers. Doc, sorry. Yeah. District two, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District three, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District four, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District five, Commissioner Mariano. Nay. District one, Chairman Oakley. Aye. Motion passed four, four one. Okay. This time we well, will. Do we need to discuss? Do we need to make a motion on how what we right. want code enforcement to do? Or, or you, now you just have to enforce the. We're going to enforce the. We're going to enforce the ordinance as written. That's what I heard. Enforce the ordinance. Ordinances right. are there for you to do the enforcement. Okay. Thank you. All right. This has got the right target. Yeah, someone's there. Really yeah. Okay. He's in an airplane. All right. Uh, again. Uh, R52 would be heard after public hearing this afternoon. At this time, we will move into uh, old business. We'll start with Commissioner Moore. All right. Thank you, sir. Give me one second. Let me pull some notes out here. We're going to see some football. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you made a video for us. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, as everybody knows, we now have COVID-19 vaccines at our public locations throughout Pasco County. So I do want to thank uh, Emergency Manager Director Jared Moskowitz um, for listening and, and, and taking a call we had uh, a couple weeks ago. I mean, he's 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 uh, doing a great job with what he has, especially, you know, he's he's been limited what he was getting coming down through the state and um, now things are picking up, um, but he's uh, been a, definitely stepped up and been a good advocate for our county. So we appreciate uh, Mr. Moskowitz and um, Governor DeSantis um, for helping out with that. Um, so our seniors, you know, in, in addition to going to the locations that the state health department already has set up in West Pasco and East Pasco, now they do have that opportunity to go to Publix's. Um, again, just a reminder that is, um, through Publix, um, sign up is not through any county website or a, any type of state website. You do need to go to the Publix in their own portal to do that. But again, thank you, Mr. or Director Moskowitz. We really appreciate you. Um, so just a follow up to our Port Ritchie uh, CRA conversation um, from the previous meeting. Um, and I want to thank Mr. Biles for he's going to be attending their uh, CRA meeting at uh, sometime at, at this after later this afternoon. So we appreciate you doing that. And I do appreciate Mayor Trimbley and, and Commissioner Starkey setting that up, um, having that conversation with us. They did have um, they had their CRA board meeting that night, um, and I did watch it um, on Ripley Up. And um, the mayor did bring up our concerns, which I appreciate. Um, I want to thank him for doing that. Um, they're, again, they're meeting again tonight when Mr. Biles is going to be there with a new city manager. And I'm sure Mr. Biles can explain to you that he had a he'll talk during his time that he did have a conversation with the city manager and it was a good conversation. Um, so I pulled the taxable values for those areas in Port Ritchie that we spoke. I spoke about that day. There's actually one street and I'm going to say it again, one street um, in Port Ritchie that a high, has a higher taxable value than the two neighborhoods that Newport Ritchie pulled out of their CRA. So that's an example. I spoke about it that day, looked up the actual taxable values through the property appraiser's site, and they're higher than the whole area that Newport Ritchie um, recently pulled out. So 
Florida statute was a 163.340, defined Sierra as, as being slum or blighted areas. Um, and that's clearly not, um, as we discussed that day, a blighted area. Second, you know, during that CRA meeting that I watched, um, I think they're confused a little bit on their authority as a community redevelopment agency. Because um, when they discuss our concerns on the entire city being within a CRA, um, one of their council members stated they did not set the boundaries. Again, the council members stated that they did not set the boundaries that the state did. Well, that's incorrect, as we all know. So I know that will be come up later this evening, and Mr. Biles has our concerns, but I just, for the record, I just want to remind them that they do set the boundaries. The state doesn't or the county doesn't. Now, if you would like us as a county to set your boundaries for you, we'll be more than happy to set those. And I have no problem doing that. Um, so they have that ability to do it. So Florida statute 163.361 modification of community development plans reads, if at any time after the approval of a community redevelopment plan by the governing body, it becomes necessary, desirable to amend or modify such a plan, the governing body may amend such plan upon the recommendation of the agency. The agency recommendation to amend or modify a redevelopment plan may include a change in the boundaries of the redevelopment area that add land or to exclude land from the redevelopment area or may include the development and implementation of community policing innovations. So I know the state audit's happening too. We'll see what goes on with that. But again, thanks, Mr. Biles, for moving forward. So I just wanted to state that for the record. And almost last, um, congratulations to the new Super Bowl champions, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. It's a big deal, right? It's huge. It's huge. First team to play, as we all know, in, in, in at home during the Super Bowl in a dominating performance by uh, the defense and Tom Brady and the entire offense as well. So congratulations and go Bucks! We are proud of you. And uh, Paso County, I know, was watching intently when that game happened. And a special happy birthday to legislative aide extraordinaire Andy Taylor. <laughs> Sheriff Taylor. Sheriff Taylor. His his, uh, his his birthday was actually on Super Bowl, so we, we are oh, celebrating today. Nice oh yeah, yeah. So, so that was a good birthday present for him. So I think with that, I'm uh, I think I'm good. Thank you. All right, Ms. Starkey. Yeah, I also want to give a shout out to our Tampa Bay Bucks. That was that was awesome. I didn't think it was going to be that close, but um, I enjoyed watching it from uh, down in St. Pete. Um, and, uh, you get that much of a blowout? Was too close. Yeah, no, I, I, I was close. predicting close. by three. <laughs> I had no idea it was going to be like that. So, um, <laughs> I don't think uh, else did. Gosh, it's, it's so frustrating that we've had a year like we've had in Tampa Bay with all our teams winning um, at such a high level and not being able to financially <laughs> recoup everything. So <laughs> I'm looking for another repeat this year. And yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, let me start at the bottom of my notes here and talk about the CRA. You know, uh, I had to leave to get on this national phone call, um, but what I really wanted to it, uh, reiterate is not only is it concerning about the, that they have the whole boundary of the city and the CRA, um, but that such a high percentage of the taxes collected are, are going to salaries yeah. rather than and, and infrastructure improvements. And that's that's really concerning to me. So I hope, I don't know if they talked about that at the meeting. Um, and uh, so I really hope you bring that message that, you know, you will. yeah, that's, that's very concerning. Um, and again, I, I think, you know, we all want to work with Port Ritchie. They've got, sure. they've got that wonderful, wonderful um, bayou there that we want it to be, you know, the best it can be and we want to help them with that sidewalk going underneath 19 right and so uh, we all need to work together but that money that they're putting towards salaries could go a long way to building that sidewalk and frankly i don't see the state giving them money to help build that if when they're misusing their tax money so we need them to get that cleaned up so that we can all work together and get that sidewalk done it, can, I, I, can i just ask you yeah it, thank you commissioner Sorry. i i think if I'm not correct, and if they would actually pull more ad valorem in some of those neighborhoods, if they pulled it out of the CRA, so it'd actually have more revenue that is not encumbered. Because if they the CR 
dollars are only supposed to be used towards certain things. So am I not correct on that? I, I'm, yeah, I'm, we haven't run the numbers. But with the area you're talking about, they may actually have more. But we've we've not run the numbers. Yeah, but I, there's a, there's a good possibility there's, but that theoretically that, that could happen. Well, more of it that they could use for other things, and then it's on board. <laughs> and and Above board. also another point that you said, you know, we understand we have the big, we have a lot of staff with a lot of expertise, and we stand ready and willing to help Port Ritchie get to where, um, you know, we all think they, they should get to. Um, I, so I also was on a call last week with um, uh, Jared Moskowitz, and um, I was very glad to hear that the state is getting that 16% bump that's guaranteed. Um, the uh, uh, a Andy Fossa had asked me to ask him about the nurses and getting more nurses because we're we're quite thin on, on nursing staff. And as we're spreading out, Going into communities, um, he and Andrew's looking for more nurses. So just putting that call out there. Um, and I continue, as I'm sure many of you do, to get emails that people are frustrated that they can't get into the system. But more and more, there are more and more avenues for our people to find ways to get vaccinated. I, I think I read this morning Walgreens is now going to start being a site and. Um, in uh, Walmart, I think. But now, whether it's here or not, I know sometimes they're rolling out in rural areas. Um, but more and more areas are are being rolled out. The problem is still the supply of the vaccines. But uh, I do, I am concerned, and want to be sure we're doing all we can to make sure that our citizens, our senior citizens who don't have access to computers and aren't computer savvy, are able to figure out how to get to get on, I, I, I'm hearing this over and over again. So um, maybe we can have um, Mike or, or someone uh, report to us again, what we're doing to help seniors. And you know, I don't know if that's his responsibility or can we, can we help? Um, I know we've got CARES involved a little bit, but, but CARES is not all over the county. So I just think we need to do a little more to help our, our, our seniors without computer skills, learn how to get vaccinated. Well, there's a telephone. Sign up. They have a telephone number? They have a telephone number as well. I know, but I, I'm hearing that it, it's really hard to get through. Oh, okay. So you have 100,000 people trying to get 1,000 shots. It's going to be hard to get through so for now. So. I'm still wondering if we, if we can be more proactive in helping people get pre-registered. Commissioner Starkey. They did say they are taking the names in queue. So if they want to have them call them back, they don't have to sit on hold all day. They will actually call them back to help them schedule so keep, the appointment. Keep going through until they get a, something, I guess. No. Um, all right. Well, I, I just wondered if we couldn't have uh, more have at our libraries yeah. or something. You got to realize that we have 130,000 65 and older seniors, we've only done about 37, 38,000. No, no. Right. I'm not saying that we need, I, I mean, the queue is the queue. I'm just saying some people don't know how to get in the queue. Oh, I understand. Yeah. And, and I hear those same yeah. calls. Yeah. Yes, we do. And we try to, through my office, we try to help them get through there, get to someone to talk to. And um, uh, so lastly, um, I got a phone call uh, from someone who's very interested in the health department building that... I guess the health department's uh, vacating um, off a of little road. Are there some county owned properties that are becoming yes. available? And I don't see Eric here. I no, he's here. Oh, there. Yeah. Okay. I can't see you. I see you. Um, <laughs> well, uh, are we, is it possible for uh, someone to purchase that? It's a, it's a charter school that's once, right nearby. They're very once, interested in it. Once we close and the health department is ready to move, then we will begin the real estate actions on their two current properties. Okay, and We're so working the with the city on the one that's in downtown process. Newport Ritchie, but the one that's on Little Road will go through the real estate process okay. that is outlined in code and statute, and anybody that, you know, that wants it can submit a bid. Okay, any idea on the timeline for that? Approximately, we are, I think we're still trying to clean up some of the some of the language around the covenant of the building that, that we're buying. Did you say a year? Is that what I heard? No, I can't see Eric. Commissioner <laughs> <laughs> Eric Breitenbach, Assistant County Administrator, uh, Internal Services. 
I, based on the, the transactions that need to take place and then the move for the health department, I'd estimate we're at least a year out before right. we are able to uh, begin that real estate process. And where are they going again? It's a building off of 52. I don't remember the exact address. I can get you that information. But we can get, to, we can get that we're, to you. We're working to close on a building. Yeah. Okay. And what about the health department in downtown Newport, Richie? So they will co-locate. They will move out of there as well. Good. And we are working with the city on that building. Okay. All right. I think that's um, it for me. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Ms. Patrick. Um, I would like to say I went up to the human trafficking event, light up the night, and it was a great turnout. So continuously raising awareness for that. Um, of course, the Bucks had a great game and I was yelling at my TV all night. <laughs> and one of the other things I wanted to mention is we are looking to build a special needs playground. So I am looking for any public input. Um, any public input is going to be appreciated for the west side of the county special needs playground. Um, lastly, with everything going on and everything that's been, tr been transpiring, I would like to know if we can show respect for our military and our armed forces. I would like to make a motion to have the six armed force flags displayed at the dais to help show respect and honor our military, our current veterans, and their families. I don't think you need a motion, but I'm fine with that. What flag is that? I would like to, for everything that they've done, if we can just put maybe three on one side and three on the other whatever the legal statue is with the American flag and the state flag. So we can honor our veterans and everything that they've done for us. Is that, is that one flag? I'm trying to understand. Is that one flag or is it? There's six armed there, forces. There'd be one for each, there'd be one for each service. Okay. So we'll look into Navy. it. Yeah. So and see if, um, see about it, obtaining them and, and put them in the right position or right place. Thank you. So it doesn't take away from the building, but we'll let facilities look at yeah. investigate how we would. And that's do that. what I say. We we'll get rid of Eric and we'll get something worked out on that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And that's it. That's it. All right. Mr. Mariano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sorry I couldn't join you all today. I had uh, back surgery last week and it's been a little bit longer recovery than expected. So uh, thanks for uh, allowing us over to happen. Perfect. Hybrid. Um, just a couple of things. Um, uh, Commissioner Sarkey and Commissioner Roker, I think you guys are right. We, we have a problem with our seniors trying to get into getting a number, um, whether it be phone call or computer. Computer is definitely tough. But even trying to get every single weekend to try to get in has been very difficult. Uh, I wouldn't mind us looking at setting up a better, let's say, a system that would allow people to get a number, even if you're going to be number 135,000 as opposed to not getting in the system, at least they'll know when they're gonna, what their number is and when they may get a shot. It may be better than just having every single weekend for the frustration where you get family members four and five feet trying to get, you know, grandma, grandpa, a, a, you know, a, an appointment. So we could take another look at that. I know I brought, brought this up a while ago, but I think it's still a big issue and I'm glad you guys are hearing it too. Um, and I wanna echo uh, Commissioner Starkey, your sentiments about, about uh, Day Spring Academy as far as the, um, uh, they've got a facility that they're building, they've been expanding all, all around. I think it would, they would be a good benefit. So if we can take a look at that uh, administrative bowels and uh, just have, make sure they're getting consideration, I think it might be a good thing for us as they are providing education for the students. Uh, full disclosure, I used to be on the board there. My wife works there, but I think it's uh, something worthwhile. Uh, and and it are, um, we have one opening on the, actually we have two openings on the Restore Act Committee. Uh, one is a citizen's slot, and one is going to be a more professional slot. Uh, Nick Mudry has been um, he's been living at Gulf Woodlands for a while. He's got experience with dredging over in McDill. Uh, I'd like to nominate Nick Mudry for the Restrike Committee citizen's large position. What was your was that a question? No, it's a it's a, mo it's a motion. Nick it's, Madri for the citizens. Who? Nick Madri for the citizen seat for restore. For restore. Uh, well, we're just finding out about the vacancy, so why don't we see? Because I I have someone who might be interested as well. I don't not I don't know Nick Madri. It could be good or bad, but do you mind if we um, put it out to the commissioners to see if there's other 
you know, a list of people and then pick from there? Okay, I'd like to I'd like to make sure we make the decision by let's say the next meeting. So for any other any, anyone else who's got someone out there, then let's bring them all in together. Yeah. Um, well, we, we you in, said two. Well, we, what is yeah, the uh, professional yeah, one? one? Uh, the professional, I think, is uh, in the uh, seafood business or or some uh, other professional group. I'll, I'll get you the title exactly, but it's a okay. more professional tone. Okay. 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 And that's the repeat, uh, that, repeat that one more time. Citizens Advisory for Restore, is that what it is? Yeah, for the Restore Act Committee. Correct. Yeah. Okay. I thought I, I, did, I just lost it for a second. Sorry. No, we just we just had a meeting the other day. It went real well. We've got a big meeting coming up April 1st. So I want to try to get everybody in position ahead of time. But, okay. We can wait for and, the next uh, meeting we, and for other resumes. Uh, if you don't mind, Jack, um, if the administrator could send everybody a list of who's currently on the Restore Committee and maybe where, where they live and who they represent what what they represent because there's some you know certain slots that have to be filled that way everyone knows who's on there and Thank then you. we'll look at that and then we're next meeting we'll bring it up and and uh set that sounds good okay thank you that's all okay. I have. all right uh mr biles yes sir i have a few things uh, i'll start with Good news. Um, so we executed the agreement with Florida Turnpike Authority on Ridge Road awesome. in, in the interchange on Friday, uh, where they fully funded their responsibility um, as they agreed to 24 years ago. Okay. And we are still on track. That, that leaves us still on track to be able to open that road to traffic in the J July timeframe. So by the time hurricane season really kicks in, we will we will be able to put traffic on that road. Um, so, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, I think a couple of commissioners mentioned uh, Port Ritchie is having a CRA meeting tonight. The city manager invited me, so I will attend, and I will bring up the points the board made, uh, specifically the two with respect to boundary, and then also with respect to the finances, and the, you know, kind of trying to get from the city a plan to to bring it into compliance from a financial perspective. And part of that is they're going to wait on their audit from the state that's due, I think, in the next 30 to 60 days, and that will probably drive that piece of it. The The third item is just for perspective. Um, you know, I, I know everybody knows Publix came on board with giving the vaccine out last week at night, all 19 locations. Uh, they're also working from the federal level and the state level to get the other pharmacies on board I just looked at a couple of their websites. They're not on board yet, but they have, they're starting to build the website. So as soon as Winn-Dixie and Walgreens are available, that they they have the website started to build to be able to take appointments that way. And for perspective, the DOH last week averaged about 1,700, and that includes Andy's IMT team, so the state team averaged about 1,700, and that's both first and second doses. But as a county, we got about 2,500 vaccinations on the day, weekdays. So we were actually getting about 800 more vaccinations in the county than DOH is getting from the state. So that's Publix, that's going other places. So that, so we are doing better. There are other options out there. And so mm -hmm. it actually may become easier to get vaccines from the Publix pharmacies pretty soon than it is from, from our yeah, from our system as well. So, and there are 19, um, 19 locations, which means you don't have to drive either, you know, to the Sears location or St. Leo. So that is ultimately the private sector, Publix, CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, Winn-Dixie, all the pharmacies will overwhelm the capacity of DOH. And that's what we need to get to. And we'll probably be there in the next several weeks, uh, which is positive. Uh, the last thing, um, I have a new chief of staff. I think most of you met her, but I want to formally introduce her board meeting, uh, Joanna Cheshire. She comes to us from the Pinellas Sheriff's Office, where she's been there for the last six years. And so she has started about a week and a half ago. So I wanted to welcome her to the team formally at a board meeting. So with that, Mr. Chair, that's all I have for now. I have one more thing. Okay. <laughs> um, some of you may know that um, Morgan, my executive assistant, has been stolen by Commissioner Wells. Um, and um, actually, is uh, yesterday was her first day starting over here in Dade City, which is much closer to where she lives in Hernando County. So I'm wishing uh, Morgan 
great luck over at the property appraiser's office. And I hired someone new, someone new. I cannot remember her last name right now, um, but her first name is um, Melanie. And she has 28 years of experience in uh, working with Senator Lee's office. She ran his office. She ran, and then she ran Dana Young's um, House and Senate office. And um, I can't remember who she was with before that, but. Uh, Where she live? Um, she lives in North Tampa, but is not yeah. um, opposed to moving. But anyway, so I have, uh, I, I welcome Melanie to um, my office and hope you all get to meet her next time you're on the West side. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Master. Oh, you know her. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, the only thing I have is in each of your blue folders, there is a letter to the chair of the canvassing uh, board, um, Judge Compton. Um, you received an email from the supervisor of elections on the 4th indicating that he could use the two uh, citizens representatives, um, Mr. Spina and uh, Mr. Giordano, um, as, um, as alternate canvassing board members, uh, for the board seats. Um, so I would like a motion to motion. authorize the chair okay. to sign that letter. Okay. Motion and second. All those in favor by roll call. District two, Commissioner Aye. Moore. District three, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District four, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District five, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District one, Chairman Oakley. Hi, motion passes five zero. Thank you. That's all I have for today. All right, Madam Clerk. Yes, so um, I'll start with something judicial then. Um, the courts are resuming trials the week of March 15th here in Pasco. Um, I also wanted to uh, mention our big shred event. I had talked about it um, at our last board meeting. We've had two events since then, one in Newport Ritchie and one in Dade City. The um, Big Shred event is to help our citizens um, properly um, get rid of their um, paperwork that may contain confidential or sensitive information. It is a partnership with the county, um, with their um, recycling and education department um, that we work really closely with Rachel Dobbs to uh, make that happen. So if you could please express our gratitude to her. We also um, work with Cam Caldell with Shred 360 to bring the shredding trucks you had Lauren Fling um, from your recycling department in Newport Ritchie and Sally Conde from the Dade City on, in our Dade City event. So um, you were well represented. They had um, given flyers out to the customers about recycling in Pasco County. So they got to recycle their, um, their paperwork and also got to learn about all the recycling opportunities here in Pasco at the same time. It was a great event in Dade City, which was this past Saturday on the 6th. Um, there were 129 cards, just under 6,000 pounds of uh, paper, and that it was an average of 46 pounds per car. In Newport Ritchie, we had um, an event that blew all of the prior numbers in the prior years away. We had 443 cars, um, 19,521 pounds of paper, and that was an average of 44 pounds per car. So um, great event, great turnout, um, and a, a, great, um, a great opportunity for our customers as well. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about is we have our Valentine's Day wedding ceremony coming up. It's this Sunday on Valentine's Day. It's going to be at two o'clock in, in front of this historic courthouse. If the weather permits, crossing fingers and saying prayers for that. Uh, we have limited the number of couples this year to allow for proper social distancing um, outside and so that we can have a safe event. Um, we did reach our limit, so it is closed for any other couples that would like to get married on Valentine's Day here with us. And that's it. Thank Sounds you. good. Um, COVID-19, um, of course, I think our only limiting factor about getting the vaccine is the vaccine itself. So. We actually, Mike Napier and his group have done a great job. If you ever watched St. Leo, I went out and watched them. In two hours, they did over 300 people. So uh, that operation very smooth. It's also very smooth on the other side of the county. And now that Publix and some of these other uh, pharmacies and all will come up with vaccines, then 
hopefully we'll get more and more. And also EOC with Andy Foss and his group's been taking care of vaccinating uh, older residents in Pitch Five and over communities. So I think staff and all have done a great job. I I still have the issue like you have, Ms. Starkey, that um, some of our older folks cannot get through on the phone. And it, it's kind of mind boggling when you think that, but uh, we have 130, thousand plus i guess 65 and older residents in pasco county the other day i heard we including uh some second shots we were like 37 38,000. i guess we're a little over that now um so they're they're doing a good job but when you have 130,000, if you've only done 38,000, it's there's got to be some patience and and getting us there to to be able to get everybody vaccine so very important. So um, uh, with that, I believe I have some pictures supposed to be pulled up. I went to the Ladder 38 truck push-in ceremony. This is our new Ladder Truck 38. It's a 100-foot ladder. It went into the Station 38. Uh, the bell on the front of uh, that truck um, Will be uh, was part of part of the new decor on that truck with that bell. It will be when that truck goes out of service, 15, 20 years when that time comes, that bell will be moved over to the next truck going in its place. And the pushing ceremony is historic because it goes back to when fire stations had a horse horse driven. Um, call them wagons or whatever for for hauling the water and all but uh you can see we're actually pushing that truck back in and <laughs> thank goodness it was on and in reverse so but uh a great day when we uh initially uh did groundbreaking and opening of, of that new uh station 38 there in watergrass uh very amazing now, that was the truck we were talking about that was coming and it's like a year later it got here. So, but uh, one point one million dollar truck. So it's pretty expensive and pretty, pretty good. It's like say a hundred foot ladder on that truck. So uh, another thing that they've started, and uh, I think they're getting some uh, national recognition, uh, recognition through the uh, chief case, and then with the the actually when they go out to a, a fairly large fire or fire. And those officers have to, that, that worked at fire, they have to change their uniforms before they leave that scene. They change into clean uniforms, come back in, and then, of course, change and, and shower and offer themselves. So it's, uh, but there's an actual truck that goes out with spare uniforms on it that the firemen go and get those and change into the clean uniforms before they enter their truck to go back into uh, to the station. So. Very neat ideas, uh, not done very much in the country. And I think when they have their, um, I believe it's a convention or something, they're gonna be speaking to, uh, they're asking Pasco County uh, how they came up with that idea and, and how to do it. Cause it, it's a very good idea for protecting the safety of our farming. So, but all good. On the way out there, I actually um, drove out Curly and Mr. Moore called me this morning on the way in. Curly was asking if Curly was going to be four lane. I think it eventually is going to be four lane, isn't it, Mr. Biles? Curly Road? Yes, sir. I eventually, don't know the exact I mean, timing of it in the CIP. It, right now. it looks like they're resurfacing. Are they widening it in portions now? I'll have to check. I, yeah, I haven't, I do think yeah. widening. I haven't driven Most that road. I know that I think the developer is doing some stuff out there right now. But if you haven't so. been out there away from Dade City and go out and hit Curly and go across toward Wesley Chapel, I remember when a lot of that was citrus citrus groves and pa of course pastures and all too, but it's kind of a bittersweet um, picture as you go out. What was there was always very nice and beautiful in the history but what's coming there is also in the same way very pretty and you know bringing it up speed new technical high school being built right there and uh just pretty amazing the thing and the growth and how things are changing in our in our eastern part of pasco county so 
Uh, does anybody have anything else they'd like to add to the meeting? Okay. If not, we'll break for lunch. We'll Mr. Chairman? come back and one. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Mariano. Thank you, sir. Uh, sorry, I hit the wrong button there. Um, That's okay. I, I, I uh, had a meeting yesterday with the Regional Planning Council. Uh, they're concerned about Senate Bill 62. Uh, Citrus County is going to have a discussion about it today. I just wonder if you guys want to discuss that. Uh, what you thought of it? Yes, yeah, so I, I had an update on with uh, you know on the fact legislative exec. I'm on the fact executive committee, and we get a report every Friday. And just so you know, um, there's a bill filed. It's the second time. Um, to get rid of um, regional planning, regional committee? planning councils, and and but allow the option if a region wants to do it voluntarily. Right. I think that'd be really hard to do to get all the counties to do something voluntarily. Yeah. And frankly, at the position that Hillsborough County's taking these days about regionalism, I'd probably be Pasco and Pinellas and not Hillsborough. Um, I do. You know, DRIs have gone away, and and so that kind of oversight has kind of fallen by the wayside with regional planning councils. However, I do think this, um, <clears throat> the attention they're making on uh, climate change and um, resiliency is a good, pla good placeholder for the, the regional planning councils. Because um, I don't know where else we could do something that may be a coordinated effort in the area. So I'm up for discussion to, um, if we want to, still support them with a more you know more fo focused role i have no idea how much money we give to them i i really don't know what the budget is so i think i got it here yeah do you know jack i don't know but i think Commissioner Moore knows <laughs> while he's look while he's looking back commissioner stark i, I do uh, share your sentiment that the resiliency of what they're working on is very important for the region uh, so I think the councils around the state can benefit from that. Uh, like you say, they've gone away, so that's not applicable anymore. But that that one thing I said this year, a couple of years ago, when I got on the council, was the best program they have going is the one probably vehicle that can actually bring us together in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. There's going to be federal federal money coming down for that. I feel. Um, yeah. I don't see what we spent last uh, year. Uh, yeah, I don't six know. Six figures. Yeah, I so don't know like, what it is. Six figures. I can have the answer after lunch. I don't remember off the top of my head and I can't search it right now. Mr. So. Chairman. Yes, sir. On Commissioner Starkey's point, there already is an interlocal agreement creating Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. It was signed in 75 and I believe it's still in place. No, I know, but this Senate bill gets rid of all of them. But I'm about to build the interlocal out. agreements, you, you had made the comment that you thought it would be difficult for the counties to co collaborate. There already is an interlocal agreement that all the counties that are in TBRPC are a member of. So they can't, the state can't. Um, it would fall back on the interlocal agreement and then, then it would be up to individual counties to pull out of that interlocal agreement if they wish to. I haven't read the bill, but I just and know that, um, in the, a lot of commissioners went up there and spoke thing. against killing the regional planning. You know how many counties are in it? In yeah. ours? In ours. It's counties and cities. It's kind of the biggest board of elected officials, actually. It is. <laughs> they changed the composition a couple of years ago. There must um, be about 15 at least, Jack. How many? I think I think it's about 21 cities and it's this counties from Citrus all the way down to uh, Manatee. Uh -huh. So it's pretty complicated. Uh -huh. Maybe we should have a discussion on a little bit after lunch. You get a chance to look at it. I know I sent them over in the afternoon yesterday, but uh, I, I'm now the chair of it this year. So um, I told them I, Commissioner Kitchen was bringing up from her, her uh, Citrus. So I. Thought we should discuss them as well. We haven't put a plan together, a place to really talk about ourselves, but uh, I do think it's worth discussion. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, it's no secret. A couple of years ago, that I, 
I had some concerns about um, money being can. forced to belong. Um, had conversations with some legislators myself, <clears throat> and most agreed. I think all agreed when I said that because I, I, I just I just think. I, whether we think it's a great, a good idea or a bad idea, I think it should still be the option to participate. We should have the option as a county. We, we think about and we complain about these unfunded mandates on a regular basis, what we're required to do. Mm -hmm. So at some point, and I'm talking about across the board, we're gonna have to get away from these unfunded mandates, you know, and give us, the local government, the power to make decisions on our own, what we want to be a part of and what we don't, when we're using taxpayer dollars. So that's something to consider. And I'm not saying that just for the regional planning council, and you know that. I've said that about everything. I just get frustrated when we're forced to be a part of something and spend tax, local tax dollars, and it's not being funded from the state or the federal government when we're required to participate. That frustrates me. It'll continue to frustrate me. Uh -huh. um, but if you look at, I think, um, wasn't the, the, I think the votes, I'm looking at the votes right here. I can share this if you don't have it. I think Commissioner Mariana probably has it, uh, the city committee members, and you probably remember some of our, some people in our local delegation in the past that also took issue of a couple of years back. It just didn't go anywhere. Yeah, but, so, but I think this, yeah. this resiliency thing is kind of new. And it needs yeah. to land somewhere. Yeah, I don't disagree. Yeah. I don't disagree with you. And I think that's a good place for it to land. I just, I just don't know how much we want to fight the state when we many, many times in different issues, we've said no more unfunded mandates, no more unfunded mandates, and then we fight against one. <laughs> yeah. That's my concern. Right. You know? Uh, but yeah. but uh, that brings up some more legislation. And I see um, Ralph over there. I... I uh, I have uh, informally talked to my legislators when I see them about the sales tax, the internet tax, and fully support um, the collection of the internet sales tax fully as a small business owner and someone who collects the correct area. Yeah. tax, sales tax. I don't understand why some people get have to pay it and some don't when they do business in Florida. I don't know if we want to formalize that in any way to send support to our, to our delegation, Tampa Bay delegation, we're in support of, give them a little cover, we're in support of, of going all the way with our, our uh, internet sales tax. I, I don't remember who's filed it. Um, Gruders, I think, is one. Um, but I think we're one of two states who don't collect it. So, come on, we can't, everything can't be on the tourism. Yeah, Commissioner Starkey, so you're a business owner, a lot of us are business owners, I'm a business owner, and um, <clears throat> I do online sales, and I submit my, I submit the sales tax. Obviously, I collect it, and I submit it. So I don't disagree when, you know, when you have some out there that aren't playing by the rules, and others are, and you're subsidizing for yeah. all of them, right? Yeah. And all and right. listen, I'm small time <laughs> compared to, you know, and it's not much I get to send the state, but I a little I, I do send them something and I also send in my penny for Pasco as well when I submit that. Um, but yes, there's a lot of large, very large organizations that aren't paying their fair share. Um, yeah, I, I agree. It's disappointing. Not like I want more taxes, but at the same time, we're going to have them. You better. You need to pay them. Yeah. And then it, it, it ends up being the small ones, the mama pops, lots of times that again that are participating and playing by the rules, and the big dogs aren't. That's frustrating. I don't disagree. Ralph Lair, Intergovernmental Affairs Officer. You are correct. So that is the Wayfair bill. Don't have the bill number right offhand. That is one that FAC uh, supports. The Florida League of Cities supports. Um, so I, I, based on the feeling that we're getting in, although it's still early and they're still in committee meetings, leadership does support that bill. Um, you hit the nail on the head. I think the, uh, the, 
the mom and pops and the and and the 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 brick and mortar stores are doing the right thing. Uh, some internet sales uh, are doing the right thing, just not all. And this will make sure it's um, an even playing field across the board. So I think that support is there, uh, and and that is the message that FAC carries. Well, I, so I would make the motion that we um, write a letter in support Second. of this effort. Great. Okay. And then I just wanted to real quick go back. So if you'll remember on the regional planning council, I sent an email yesterday at 444 to all of you. Um, it's got the overview that was done by the Tampa Bay regional planning council and the sample resolution. And I also provided you um, the staff analysis for Senate bill 62. Currently there is not a house bill on that, uh, on the bill right as, as of yet. Um, so you'll, you'll get a, an understanding of, of what that bill does, um, if it were to pass, but again, no house sponsor at this point in time. Okay. So, uh, I've got a motion and a second to, uh, support that bill. Do a letter. I don't know the number. Okay. The number. I'll, we'll I'll, I'll go pull it and, uh, put that together for y'all. Yeah. Get with Marie and put that letter together, but by roll call vote. I'm sorry, District 2, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 1, Chairman Oakley. Aye. Motion passed 5 0. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? Is it? All right. We're going to adjourn till 1 30. See you back here then. <laughs>